All right, we're good to go. Okay. And Hannah's on. Thank oh. you. I'm Melissa. <laughs> it says that I'm Melissa. <laughs> All good. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Ruben Ricoba, a pediatrician from Pediatrust, and your moderator for tonight's live question and answer session. Uh, joining me on the panel tonight is Dr. Melissa Keene. And because both of you say Melissa Keene under your <laughs> picture, I'm going to have you wave. That's Melissa. Uh, Melissa is an OBGYN from the Midwest Center for Women's Health, uh, which has offices all over the north and northwest suburbs. Uh, and she sees patients at their Glenview and Evanston Central Street office. Um, also joining us is Hannah Goldstein. Uh, there's Hannah. Thank you. Certified lactation consultant and head of Pediatrust uh, lactation team. Oh, and I see we fixed her uh, moniker as well. So good. All right. Um, I'd just like to ask everyone else on the call to uh, mute your a phone or your computer, whatever you're using, uh, so that we uh, don't uh, hear a, a lot of background noise. Uh, we've had a lot of questions come in uh, from the audience over the last few weeks when you registered, um, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. You also have the ability to send in a question through the live chat function on Zoom or through Facebook Live. And again, we'll try and get to as many of those as possible, but we want to try and wrap this up uh, at an hour. Since we started a few minutes late due to some technical glitches, uh, we'll uh, stop uh, around 7.05. Um, and don't worry, if you do miss something or you need to leave early, we are recording this session and a link will go out to everybody uh, who registered by email. Uh, we'll send that link and a few of the other resources that we will mention uh, tonight. Um, and we'll send that out in the next few days. Uh, all right. Uh, the link uh, to the recording will also be available on the website for both Pediatrust and the Midwest Center uh, for Women's Health. So be sure to check both of those websites if you didn't uh, technically register for the event uh, by email and you can get the link that way as well. All right, let's start tonight's uh, forum with Dr. Keen, our special guest who's prepared some remarks for us. And I'll remind Dr. Keene that many of the moms or soon to be moms uh, have uh, a lot of questions, but many of them are uh, centered around the same uh, concerns, such as um, what happens in the hospital if a mother tests positive for COVID? Uh, should a mother quarantine before delivery um, if there's a scheduled a delivery date? Um, and who is and is not allowed to visit uh, during um, uh, labor and delivery. Uh, Dr. Keene, what can you tell us uh, about delivering in a baby in this pandemic? So thank you so much for having me. What I want to do first is just go over what COVID-19 in pregnancy looks like, specifically how we define the illness and how we manage it. And then after that, I'll go over some of the policies for both prenatal care and then, of course, when someone is on labor and delivery. So first of all, if a patient has COVID-19 in pregnancy, we place them into one of five categories, which is gonna be asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, or critical disease. The vast majority of patients are gonna be mild, which is symptoms like fever, cough, sore throat, headache, but they don't have any shortness of breath and they won't have any abnormal chest imaging. Once a patient hits severe, that means we're actually seeing a drop in their oxygen level, particularly below 93%. In pregnancy, we want an oxygen level at least at 95% or higher to make sure both the mother and the fetus are getting adequate perfusion. And so once a patient hits severe, those are the patients that will be hospitalized. And then critical is going to be the patients that need ventilatory support or are presenting in septic shock or other organ dysfunction. There actually is an algorithm that we use to determine where patients fall. It was developed by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which is our main organization. And then also by SMFM, which is our Society for High Risk OB. I'm just gonna show you all an algorithm that we use for it. 
So let me go and share this for a second. So if you look first, whenever a patient calls and is concerned that they could have COVID, we initially just ask symptoms. All you need is one symptom to warrant testing, meaning you could call with just a cough and we'd actually recommend testing because we have an incredibly low threshold to know if the pregnant patient is positive. If you then go on to get tested and you are positive, we ask a series of questions about your illness severity, meaning are you having shortness of breath? Are you coughing up blood? Are you able to keep hydrated? If any of these are positive, you're gonna end up being referred to the emergency department to see if you need to be admitted to the hospital. If you don't have any of those positive answers, we then are gonna check you for any comorbidities things like high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. If any of those are positive, we want to see you. It just doesn't have to be an emergency room setting. So what we would do is we would see you in the office to determine what your oxygen level is, and then also determine if we should order a chest x-ray for you. If any of those findings are abnormal, again, we would recommend possible hospital admission. If all these answers continue to be no, these are the patients that are going to stay at home. And our goal for you is just that you do supportive care at home and over the next 14 days, you aren't coming into the office and we'll see you for prenatal care once that acute illness is resolved. The good news is we do know that the vast majority of pregnant women do quite well with COVID in pregnancy. There is a large registry in the United States called the Priority Study. It's based out of University of California, San Francisco. And the goal was all pregnant patients that had COVID were encouraged to enroll in this study starting in March. So far, they've published data from the first thousand patients. Um, what we have found is that pregnant patients do present a little bit differently. Um, they tend to present more often with cough or sore throat. And actually fever is much less likely. Only 12% of the pregnant patients had a fever. We also know symptoms do last longer in pregnant patients. So on average, takes about 37 days for symptoms to fully resolve. In terms of who gets COVID, 67% of these positive patients had contact with a positive case, which is why social distancing is so critical. And if you do have a known exposure, we would recommend testing for you. And then additionally, a third of these patients were in fact healthcare workers. The most positive finding of the study, though, was that 95% of these 1,000 patients did not require hospitalization. So again, most pregnant patients are doing really well. There also is one other study that came out of New York that looked at their first 462 positive cases among pregnant women. They did have a slightly higher rate, so 70 of their patients were admitted which was 15%. So again, we know somewhere between five to 15% of pregnant women are gonna require additional care. But the key part was only 3% require intensive care unit admission. And that's really the critical part that we want to avoid because once a patient is in the ICU, that's when mortality rates go up significantly. Now in general, the mortality rate for COVID in pregnancy is very low. It's 0.4% whereas the baseline general population is closer to 3%. So pregnant women are doing better than others, um, but obviously that's still real. And then the other part that we know is the last pandemic we had, which was the H1N1 influenza, which was in 2009. Um, in that season, 1% of pregnant women had the flu, but they accounted for 5% of the deaths. So pregnant women actually did worse with H1N1, which is why it's so critical that all pregnant women get an influenza vaccine this year. Um, in terms of hospitalization, if you are hospitalized, there are two key medications we're going to give you. One of them is called remdesivir. Remdesivir is an antiviral, and the reason we give it is it actually decreases your duration of symptoms. And then we'll also give you low-dose dexamethasone. That is a steroid that's shown to decrease mortality in patients. But additionally, this is a medication we normally give in pregnancy to anyone that we're concerned could be in preterm labor and have a preterm delivery. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is it helps baby's lungs mature a little bit faster. And so we're giving this knowing that it's gonna help both the mother and the fetus. So anyone, again, who comes in severe or critical will get those two medications in addition to oxygen. 
Now, in terms of prenatal care, the great news is the vast majority of prenatal care is very similar to what we were doing prior to COVID. Because we're in phase four right now, we actually have the exact same number of visits, which typically means you'll come in once a month in the first two trimesters, and then you're gonna come in more often in the third trimester. The biggest change though, is that unfortunately we do not allow visitors for prenatal care visits. Um, we realize this is really challenging, and of course we would love to have your partner there, but we are trying to decrease any risks of additional transmissions in our office. Um, Fortunately, at our Midwest Center, we have not had any occupational exposures, and the goal is to keep it that way for both our staff and our patients. This also holds true for ultrasounds. The vast majority of hospital systems are not allowing partners to come in for ultrasounds. Now, for labor and delivery, there also are some changes, but in general, labor and delivery most of the time is a very happy place. In terms of policies that we have in place, so if you have a scheduled delivery, meaning you're either going to be induced or you have a scheduled C-section, we're going to have you come in three days prior to that scheduled delivery and we do a COVID test. The goal is you then quarantine over those next three days so that way you don't convert to a positive prior to coming in. When you do come in for that scheduled delivery, we recommend that you and your partner wear a mask your partner does not have to get tested for COVID, but they will be screened with a temperature check and then answering a number of COVID questionnaires. When you're in the room, we try and ask that you keep your mask on whenever there's a healthcare provider in the room. And then for delivery, we realize it is challenging to push with a mask on. Um, and so what providers do is we wear full PPE in the event that a patient needs to take her mask off, she can. In terms of who you can have with you, so you're allowed one support person, meaning your partner, whoever you choose to have with you. And then at Evanston Hospital, which is where I deliver, we do allow doulas. They just need to be certified and they can be with you during labor. They just can't stay for postpartum. And then moving on, one of the most important questions we got is, what if I'm positive for COVID at the time of delivery? What does this mean? So this does happen, um, and we certainly have had patients that either tested positive prior to their scheduled induction, so they did know ahead of time, or if they didn't have a scheduled delivery and they just come in laboring, we do test them when they get there. Um, every patient, no matter what, will get a COVID test. And so if your COVID test comes back positive, there are a few changes we have. One is we do move you to an isolation room so that's what's called a negative pressure room. The air is constantly being filtered out with the goal that the virus is removed from the room. Whenever a provider is in the room, we will absolutely be in full PPE, meaning you know, face shield, goggles, mask, gown, gloves. Um, both you and your partner will have to keep your mask on the whole time. And then at the time of delivery, the main difference is that we will test the baby for COVID. Some hospitals will test right at delivery. Some will test 24 to 48 hours later, but at some point in that immediate postpartum period, the baby will get tested. The great news is babies do not need to be separated from moms if the mom is positive for COVID. Um, this question came up quite a bit and we actually don't recommend separation. We know that skin to skin contact in those first few hours of life is critical. It actually helps reduce postpartum hemorrhage, it helps reduce our rates of postpartum depression and anxiety. And it also increases successful breastfeeding. And so we don't separate the baby. However, there's a few protocols we have in place. What we would recommend is that when you're not directly feeding the baby or changing the baby, you try and keep the bassinet six feet from you in the room. And then of course, whenever you are directly holding the baby, you make sure you're wearing a mask and that you've practiced appropriate hand hygiene. The one hard challenge would be if your partner was positive for COVID. If your partner is positive for COVID, they unfortunately cannot be there at the time of delivery. And we would recommend that you bring a different support person. Um, we know that is so hard and we hope that no one is in that situation, which is why a lot of people ask, do I need to quarantine these last two weeks? I think that's not realistic for a lot of people. Many people work outside the home or many people have kids that they have to take place. 
So all we would recommend is that you try to just be as careful as possible in this last couple of weeks. You wear your mask very consistently. And then in terms of social interactions, I would try to just keep it to your immediate circle those last couple of weeks with the goal that you're negative at the time of delivery. And then lastly, I just want to stress that the reason we don't separate the moms from the babies is that the rate of transmission to babies is so low. Um, from that same priority study, they looked at the first 260 infants and only 1% ended up testing positive. And in those 1% that test positive, they typically have asymptomatic or mild disease. So again, there's really no benefit to separating baby from mom. So our goal is gonna certainly keep you together. I'm gonna pause there for now. I know I just covered a lot. Um, I will certainly come back and ask, um, answer more questions later, but we'll keep going. It's okay. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Keene. Uh, a lot of good information there. I do want to reiterate for those who may not have caught it, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the transmission of the virus from a COVID positive mom to a baby is the same as with anybody else. It is not through the blood into the placenta, into the baby. It's after the baby is born, then mom will cough or sneeze or somehow infect the baby after uh, the baby is born. Isn't that right? So far, yes. So we've been studying the placentas in these patients and it appears that the SARS virus can't easily bind to the placenta. It doesn't have the right receptor. And so we think vertical transmission then can't happen because of that. Right. So that's good news for all of you who are pregnant. And if you get uh, uh, COVID, you know, well before delivery, there's essentially zero chance that the baby will have it on delivery. Uh, again, the, the possibility is you're contagious. You have COVID right around the time of delivery. And then once the baby comes out, um, you can uh, spread the virus that way, just like you could to, you know, anybody else, but not, uh, not get, the baby won't get it in the womb. So that's a piece of good news there. All right, let's move on to Anna Goldstein, our lactation consultant. And Anna, what can you tell us about breastfeeding during the pandemic? And specifically, is it safe for a mother who's COVID positive to breastfeed? Thank you, Dr. Koba. Um, as Dr. Keen mentioned, and you mentioned, um, the virus does not transfer to the baby in utero through the blood, through the placenta. It also does not transfer in the breast milk. So there have been numerous studies on this now, um, and therefore it, we feel it is incredibly uh, beneficial for the baby to breastfeed, uh, just like it has always been beneficial for the baby to breastfeed. Um, there are benefits both to the, to the, well, to the mom, to the baby, as well as to, uh, you know, society at large. So um, what are the benefits? The benefits for the baby, um, reduce risks of infections, reduce risk of asthma and eczema and childhood cancers. Um, in the, those are long-term risks um, that are reduced by breastfeeding, long-term uh, reduction in risk of obesity. Um, that's a public health issue as well as personal health issue. Um, these are all benefits for the baby, um, as well as um, Breastfeeding helps the baby in the first few days regulating their temperature, regulating their breathing, re regulating their heart rate. Um, all of these things are uh, accomplished by breastfeeding, especially with skin to skin. Um, so those are tremendous benefits um, that are the same now as they've always been. Um, the benefits to mom are uh, decreased incidences long-term of different types of cancers ovarian cancer, breast cancer, uh, the longer mom breastfeeds, the, the lower her risk for these kinds of cancers. Um, it also helps moms get back to their pre-pregnant weight um, faster than if they were bottle feeding. Um, with exclusive breastfeeding, without any introduction of bottles, even of express breast milk or uh, bottles of formula, 
breastfeeding um, can be as much as 98% effective at preventing another pregnancy uh, so close to the one you just had. So um, it's not 100%, but it, uh, mm -hmm. with exclusive breastfeeding, it can be 98% uh, effective. Um, so those are, those are some of the benefits for baby as well as for mom. There's no question that it helps increase bonding between mother and baby. That does not mean mm -hmm. that if a mom doesn't breastfeed that she will not bond with her baby. That, that's not true. Um, but the skin to skin contact, the act of breastfeeding does, um, mm -hmm. help with bonding. Um, another advantage for the baby is that if the baby um, does come in contact with some germs, um, viruses, or bacteria, before they even show any sign of illness, they pass those um, germs to the mom. The mom then can make antibodies and pass them back to the baby through the breast milk. So breastfeeding is, is quite impressive uh, in what it can do to help keep our babies healthy. Um, in terms of society, um, things like the cost of, of breastfeeding versus the cost of formula, um, there's no comparison. Uh, the extra food that a breastfeeding mom needs will cost about $300 a year, whereas the cost of the, the ready-made formula or um, the concentrated formula, those are the only two that are appropriate for a newborn because they're sterile the cost of that is above $1,200 a year. So um, even just the economic perspective um, is, is also important to take into consideration. Um, so those are, those are some of the benefits um, and those are always present, whether we're in the middle of a pandemic. If you, you, know, if you wanna look at the pandemic situation or any kind of a natural disaster, um, breastfeeding is, is available uh, and free and always there, whereas um, just like we were struggling to find enough Lysol and enough toilet paper um, with the pandemic, we could also, you know, there were people who were struggling to find uh, enough formula. So, and that can happen in a natural disaster or in a pandemic, whereas that's not going to happen with breast milk. Thank you, Anna. Um... And that's also very helpful. Uh, so good to know, very safe. And uh, like you said, a lot of benefits, pandemic or no. All right, so uh, the next thing we're gonna do is I will address what happens when you finally get to take the baby home. You know, you've gone through pregnancy, you've delivered the baby and it's time to go home. So uh, what do you do then? Well, first of all, congratulations to all of you. Um, obviously starting or building your family is a wonderful experience. There's a lot of anxiety out there now about the pandemic, whether you're pregnant or not. And I hope that you all get to enjoy this time. You've heard from Dr. Keen that it's safe uh, to be pregnant and safe to deliver uh, a child uh, in the pandemic. And it's safe to breastfeed if um, you, know, you uh, desire to do that. So um, you know, all of that uh, is good to know. And taking the baby home will require some changes from pre-pandemic times. Um, but the first thing I would say is the piece of advice I would give to all of you. It's the same that I gave even before the pandemic hit. And that is that um, everybody who comes to visit the baby, uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, godparents, friends, neighbors, whoever comes to visit should be fully vaccinated. Um, the most important vaccines that visitors should have are uh, the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, or for adults, it's the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, also called the Tdap, T-D-A-P. The most important of those is the P, the pertussis, which is whooping cough. An adult who gets whooping cough coughs for uh, several weeks, maybe a couple of months. It's annoying, but nothing more than that. However, if an infant gets whooping cough, it can be very severe, uh, requiring hospitalization, and at times it can even be fatal. So it's very important that whoever comes to visit has gotten a Tdap within the last 10 years. And I would, if I were you, put my foot down about that. Very, very important. Um, uh, the other 
vaccine that everybody should be getting, particularly now at this time uh, of the year, is the flu vaccine. We cannot vaccinate anybody for flu until they are six months old. So even if your child were born now, um, would not be able to get the flu vaccine until the middle or end of April. And by then, flu season is probably almost over. So the only way to protect a baby born in these next few months against the flu is to have everybody around the baby vaccinated against the flu. So again, I would put my foot down about those two vaccines, the flu and the Tdap. Make sure that everybody who comes to visit gets them. And if they put up a fuss, you tell them it's doctor's orders. You can blame me, you can blame your pediatrician, but tell them it's our fault. Um, all right. Uh, for all visitors who come, the other thing you want to make sure is that they are healthy. Whether they're vaccinated or not, they could just have some run-of-the-mill illness that can uh, affect the baby. So you need to ask specific questions. Do you have a fever? Are you coughing? Are you uh, having trouble breathing? Uh, do you have vomiting, diarrhea? Uh, some of this stuff is personal. Uh, some of this stuff doesn't make for a pleasant dinnertime conversation. But you need to ask these questions just to make sure that visitors aren't introducing a, a contagious or infectious disease um, into the household, um, protecting not only the baby, but you. Your body's been weakened by everything you've gone through um, and your partner and anybody else who happens to be home, other kids, um, other visitors. Um, also, um, you need to make sure that they haven't been exposed to anybody with COVID. So, um, Hi, I'm sorry, we're not able to hear you, or at least I'm not, sorry. I can't hear either. Uh, How about now? I'm good there. Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. sorry. Um, so uh, just make sure that nobody's been exposed to COVID. Even if they don't have symptoms, obviously if they've been exposed, uh, they could come in and transmit the, the virus. So uh, that was the last bit that I was talking about. So during COVID times, the other uh, change is Obviously, everybody who comes over should be wearing a mask, um, even if you know that they haven't been exposed, even if you know they're not sick, should be wearing a mask. They should always wash their hands and um, using soap and water, washing thoroughly for about 20 seconds is a good idea um, anytime before they pick up the baby. So uh, most would be um, willing to do that for you. Um, if someone is traveling from out of town, you want to encourage them to try and come uh, to your home in as safe a way as possible. And that means driving if possible. I know that's not always possible. Um, if they do fly, see if they can fly in an airline where there is some social distancing, meaning there's not a person right next to them on either side, but there's a, a seat in between them and uh, the person, uh, unless they're traveling with their spouse or a family member who they've always been with. Um, but if possible, that's a good idea too. Um, and also just as a general rule of thumb, limit the number of visitors you have um, and space them out. So let's say for example, all four grandparents wanna come visit as is natural and that's fine. But there's no reason why all four of them need to be there at the exact same time, right? You need some help in the morning, have a, one or two of them come. You need some help in the afternoon or evening have one or two of them come and kind of space them out if possible. Um, and for visitors, for people who want to help you, but you want to limit the visitation, um, there's lots of other things that people can do. Obviously, even before the pandemic, neighbors, coworkers, church members, whatever, they can uh, make you a meal so you don't have to cook and shop and do all that other stuff. Um, and they could leave it on the front door step. They can uh, give it to, uh, you know, your mother-in-law if she's, there they can certainly hand it off to her they don't necessarily need to come into the house and see the baby that's what zoom meetings like this are for right you can uh schedule them at your convenience when you feel good you can show the baby um and you know they can get their fill that way 
So try and limit the number of visitors. And I would say the most important thing is what I mentioned before. Really try and put your foot down about everybody having those vaccines I mentioned and everybody washing their hands and trying to stay away if they're not healthy. And again, you can always blame uh, your pediatrician or me um, and say, this is what the doctor says is what we need to do uh, during this pandemic. So don't be afraid to set limits. Um, and speaking of your pediatrician, uh, now it's time for a shameless plug of Pediatrust. I'm uh, going to tell you that you can, if you're looking for a pediatrician, this is your first baby, then you can certainly call any of our offices and arrange to have a virtual meet and greet with one of our pediatricians just to make sure that um, your philosophy and their bedside manner matches with what you would like to see in a pediatrician. Um, and all of our office locations, uh, the addresses, the phone numbers, and bios of all of our uh, doctors and nurse practitioners are available on our website, uh, pediatrust.com. Uh, all right. Uh, now, let's um, get to a few questions that the audience has sent in. Uh, Dr. King, one question that got sent to us earlier is this one. Uh, I know you said that there's no separation uh, of the baby from the mom, but um, you know, some hospitals have different policies and uh, mothers are still afraid that something is going to happen where that does occur. So one mom asked, um, is it possible just to simply refuse a COVID test? That way, there's no way of knowing if she's positive or not. There's no way of then separating the mom from the baby for that reason. What would you tell a mother who asks, can I just refuse a COVID test? So honestly, I, I wouldn't recommend refusing it. Um, the vast majority of time that mother should be negative. Um, technically, the mom can refuse. They are allowed to. This hasn't come up often, but there have been a few cases where this has happened. I'd say the one challenging part to it is actually related to anesthesia. So technically getting an epidural is considered elective and some anesthesiologists may not be willing to place it if a patient doesn't have a COVID results. And then it's even more important if something emergent happens. So this doesn't happen often, but there are times where we have to do an urgent cesarean section and if a patient doesn't have any, any anesthesia at that point, she will have to get intubated. That is considered the highest risk time for aerosolizing the virus. And so again, anesthesia is gonna be quite upset if they don't have a results. And what we would have to do is urgently try and get everyone in full PPE to avoid a potential exposure if that patient really was positive. So it certainly encouraged the patient to get tested um, but recognizing that it is, at the end of the day, still her choice. Okay. And while we're on the subject of uh, delivery, a question came in on the chat. Can a partner come and go during um, the postpartum period? Meaning, uh, can the partner go to work and then come sleep in the room with the mother at night after delivery? Sorry, I'm muted. Um, they actually can come and go. All that we ask is that when they come back, they just have to get rescreened, meaning they get their temperature taken again and they ask her the COVID questions. But people leave all the time. They might want to go get food. They might want to feed their dogs, whatever it may be. So certainly. Okay. Uh, Anna, we'll take uh, you for the next question. And that is, uh, one mom wanted to know uh, if there are remote sources of education for breastfeeding uh, that she can use during the pandemic. And uh, what can you tell us about that? Okay, good question. Unfortunately, the hospitals are not offering in-person classes. And I certainly do encourage um, mo moms and their partners to um, educate themselves as much as possible before delivery. The more information that you have before the baby is born, the better prepared you are for successful breastfeeding. Um, I know most couples prepare for labor and delivery, but they don't prepare for a single minute after that. So it is definitely recommended that you uh, start to think about that. Um, the hospitals, some of them might be offering some virtual classes um, that you can attend. Uh, obviously not as good as in person, but it is good. Um, and there are lots of books out there. Uh, we will have some links to some videos that are excellent out of Stanford University. 
um, and I highly recommend that you watch those. Uh, and we are hoping uh, in the next couple of months to be able to offer our own virtual prenatal breastfeeding class. And as soon as we have that information, we will be um, publicizing that as much as we can via social media, our website, um, the Midwest Center for Women's Health website. Uh, we will get that information out to you as soon as we have it available when we'll be ready to start that. So um, those, those opportunities are out there. Sometimes you have to look for them, but they're well worth it. Uh, thank you. Um, we got a couple of questions about uh, what, uh, specific questions about what happens when the baby comes home, and I'll take those now. One is, how long after birth can grandparents and immediate family members visit? Uh, should they wait 14 days and self-quarantine? And I want to address this next question sentence first. We were told that the first six weeks are the most crucial, so not to have anyone visit during that time. So first of all, the one thing I forgot to mention is you're going to need some help, okay? Um, no matter how well prepared you think you are, and I'm sure many of you are very well prepared, and um, how uh, good your partner is, uh, there are just two of you, and um, You'll be waking up, one of you at least, and probably both of you, um, every couple of hours um, for the next several weeks and months. So sleep deprivation has a way of really, really affecting everything. Uh, your, your mental abilities, your physical abilities, your judgment, your decision-making abilities, everything. Um, it's just no fun. So um, you're going to need some help, whether that's a family member, whether that's paid help, whether that's just some kid down the street, whether that's your neighbor, whatever it is. So don't be afraid to have people come and visit. Um, I mean, if you look back at, at history, sociologically, we don't just say, okay, now you go and deliver your baby and nobody's going to visit you for six weeks. I mean, that just doesn't happen in any society at any point in the history of mankind. So often, you know, in the old days, uh, we used to live with our parents forever and ever and our families would, you know, sort of be clustered together and you would have the wisdom of the older generation to help you. Uh, and while that isn't always the case now, it certainly helps to have somebody. And again, whether that's your mother, your mother-in-law, an aunt, um, an older sister, somebody to help you out. Um, I, I think if you're you're going to need some help. Don't be afraid to take it. So no, um, visitors are fine in the first part we already described. Uh, going back to the first part of the question, which is how long after birth can grandparents, immediate family members visit? You can do that the very next day. That's fine with me. Um, again, given those caveats that I mentioned. Um, should they wait 14 days and self-quarantine? Meaning, you know, 14 days after the baby's born to, to come help. Um, you know, that's a personal decision. I, I don't think they have to do that. If they're relatively healthy, they've been doing the right things, if they've been masking and social distancing, then um, no, I don't think they really need to do that. Um, if your in-laws, your parents are the kind that don't believe in wearing a mask, they're not social distancing, they're going to large crowds, they're going out to bars and restaurants, where there's no social distancing. They live in Florida, they're going to crowded beaches. I, I don't know, you know, ask them what they're doing. Um, and if they're like that, then yeah, then they probably need to quarantine for 14 days. Good luck with that. But um, I think most grandparents wanna do the right thing and they will curtail their behavior and do what's right in order to see their grandchild. So uh, take advantage of that. Um, uh, imperative and you know tell them this is what you got to do before you come see the baby and most of the time you'll get them to agree to that um, so i hope that answers your question all right um uh dr keen uh, another question that came up is and this is very very basic but it's come up a lot given the pandemic is it safe to even consider getting pregnant at this time or should a woman sort of postpone that decision? Stay to that. So we actually don't recommend postponing conception. 
we don't think that these reproductive decisions, whether it's pregnancy planning or the opposite end of the spectrum with termination, should be based just on is that the pregnancy related risks do not seem to be lasting a short period of time. I think we still have significant time in front of us. And once a woman is in her mid to late thirties and beyond, every year matters. And so I certainly would not recommend delaying childbearing. And I think there are ways to do it in a very safe manner. And there are some perks to it. I have to say, my first trimester patients that get to work from home um, when they're not feeling so great, it's really nice. And you're not missing out on much when you're in that initial maternity leave. So I think it's a good time to have a baby. Good to know. All right, uh, Hannah, we had a couple of questions come in uh, earlier in the week. Um, and they, uh, there were several of them around the same theme, and that is breast milk from other sources. So, for example, I, I know that there is a breast milk bank that mothers can um, uh, access. Um, and one mom had the question about using breast milk from the surrogate that they're using if the mother contracts COVID. Um, are these other sources safe in this pandemic? And what can you tell our expectant moms about those sources? Um, okay, good question. Um, first of all, we do have a, um, the Mother's Milk Bank of the Western Great Lakes, um, and they have very strict policies, just like a blood bank would have strict policies about how they take care of the milk that they get that's donated to them. Um, a lot of their milk is actually used in NICUs uh, because it's very well known that um, preemies do much, much better if they have breast milk. So a lot of this donated milk um, is, uh, is used by hospitals in their NICUs. Um, so the, the process of working with a surrogate uh, I'll just address that for a minute. The, um, when you work with a surrogate, the mom who's going to be carrying the baby is carefully, carefully screened uh, for any type of medical condition or reason why she should not be a candidate to be your surrogate. So I think in that screening process, um, they are also covering any issues that might come up um, when, um, you know, when, when, when the baby's born and whether or not this surrogate mom can also provide breast milk for the baby that she carried. Um, I think that needs to be a conversation early on in the pregnancy um, and a discussion with the OBs uh, who are involved in, in helping you with, your, um, with the surrogate pregnancy. Um, but I think it probably would be safe since mom is, is screened so carefully uh, before she becomes a surrogate. Um, and then um, the, other, the other issue that we know of is that the breast milk uh, does help protect, it's actually specifically the whey protein helps protect the babies from COVID. Um, but that's kind of a mixed blessing because if you are getting milk from a milk bank, they are pasteurizing it. Um, it's heating it for a, at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time. That's to help kill bacteria and viruses. But in the process, it's also reducing the effectiveness of uh, the whey protein that is actually protecting the baby from COVID. So um, it's still better by far than formula, uh, but it's the antibacterial, antiviral properties of breast milk uh, that makes it such magical food for babies. So, um, so breast milk from a breast bank, from a milk bank uh, is definitely preferable over formula if you can. And there are places where um, here in, in Illinois that, that moms and you know, families can purchase um, breast milk from the milk bank. So it is a safe option um, and it is definitely um, great for baby if that's you know if that's what you need and it is a resource that's out there and and very safe thank you Anna, for that i'm not sure how many uh 
moms out there knew about those resources, but uh, uh, hopefully they don't need them, but if they do, good to know that they're out there. All right, so I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here. We had several that came in um, over the last few weeks about daycare, and somebody uh, in the chat asked about siblings in the home who then go to school, and is that safe in there? kind of the same thing, you know, introducing your baby into the greater world, not just your house and your visitors, but exposure from other sources, um, whether the baby goes somewhere or you're bringing germs into the house with siblings. So let me address that. So um, first of all, if you are going to be returning to work uh, at some point in the next few months, um, don't feel guilty at all about uh, sending your child to daycare, whether that's a nanny, whether that's a home daycare, whether that's an institutional daycare. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why uh, women need to go to work, provide for your family, continue your career, uh, lots of other reasons, and all of them are valid. And um, using a daycare uh, to uh, uh, help with that is a necessary part of life. And the good news is a study just came out this past week, published in the pediatric journals, um, that took, it was quite large, uh, looked at 57,000 daycare providers across the country that serve 4 million children. So a very large study. And it showed that the workers, the adults in these daycare facilities were at no higher risk of getting COVID than the general population. And they looked at the adults, not the children in the daycares, because the adults are much more likely to get COVID than the children are. So if the adults aren't at any higher risk than the children certainly aren't. And I will tell you in our practice, since uh, daycare started opening up, uh, you know, late spring, early summer, we have not seen uh, a much higher incidence of COVID in those children than, than we do in, in, in the general population. So I would say that study of 4 million kids is uh, right on the money and it, it's what we're seeing too. So the, the message is daycares are safe. And um, uh, there's a few things that you can ask your daycare provider, whether that's an in-home daycare or uh, institutional daycare, a few things you can ask. Um, what is your protocol for keeping children safe? What is your protocol when a staff member um, is sick, even if it's not COVID, if they just have a cough or a cold, what do you do? Do you encourage them to stay home? Um, how do you handle that? Um, what do you do if one of the other children is sick? Um, do you require a note from the doctor? Do you require a negative COVID test? Do you require a certain amount of days to go by? What's the story there? And remember, you're not only asking this about the other children so that your child is safe. You're asking this because it will pertain to you at some point. Your child may get sick, uh, probably not from COVID, but just some little cold or something. And then you need to know what to do. So it's always a good idea to have a backup plan. Um, what am I gonna do if I wake up at six in the morning, and my child has a fever now, and I have to be at work at nine? Um, do I go to work? Do I take the day off? Does my partner take the day off? Do I have a backup plan? My mother, my mother-in-law, the neighbor? I don't know. But it's always good to have a, a backup plan uh, just in case, because at some point in time, if you're using daycare, that situation is gonna come up, and they're probably gonna, they're not gonna let your child in. Uh, at least not that day. So, um, uh, so there's lots of questions to ask. Those are just some of the important ones. When we send out the link for the recording, we will also include a link to a CDC website that talks a lot about what daycares can do uh, to keep kids safe, and uh, specifically daycares, not schools. And uh, that link will be in the email that goes out to all the registrants. So you can look that up uh, if you don't want to bother with the link, you can just go to the CDC website, cdc.gov, click on the coronavirus section, and then just type in daycare. And that page that comes up has a lot of good information about daycares. You can use those protocols to ask your daycare provider if they're following these. That's a good place to start. I'm going to transition now into the school. For those who have kids at home already, the siblings will be going to school and coming back. Um, you know, this, is a, a, this was a common problem even before the pandemic, right? So this is, as long as kids have been going to school, we've always had this issue. Um, it's not a big deal. Um, with the way that the schools have been handling the pandemic, and they're very, very cautious, um, we have not seen a surge 
in children um, getting COVID. Um, the searches that have been happening most recently in the state uh, are not among school-aged children. They're among uh, teenagers, they're among older, young adults, um, and older people who are just congregating at birthday parties, at uh, fraternity parties on college campuses, at places like that, large crowds of people, not masks, not obeying social distancing rules. Um, so that's a comp that is what accounts for most of the surge that we've been seeing in the states, not only all around us, but also in Illinois. But the schools, many of which have been open for the last two months, um, have not been a source of a widespread uh, COVID illness. So um, obviously there's things to do. When your child comes home from school, the first thing I would do is make them wash their hands and I'd probably change their clothes just to be on the safe side. Um, if the child comes home and is sick, then you need to do everything you can to keep that child away from the baby as much as possible. And I would say that even pre-COVID times, um, at least during those first couple of months uh, until the child has been, until the baby has been uh, vaccinated uh, against those uh, diseases. Um, but uh, have the child who's going to school uh, wash their hands the minute they come through the door, change their clothes and um, keep them away from the baby if they're ill. And that's probably the most that you can do there. Um, all right. Um, and I think that was all that we had to say about a daycare. Uh, Dr. Keen, um, we had another question that came up on the ch chat, and that was um, about, um, oh, I think you've already answered it. Uh, about testing and um, about healthcare testing. But if people can't read the chat, do you want to explain what you, uh, uh, how you answered those questions? Yeah, so someone had just asked um, if healthcare providers um, doing a cesarean section are tested for COVID, and if so, how many hours or days prior to surgery? So healthcare providers are not routinely tested. However, every single day we are screened. Um, so when we walk into the hospital, there's actually a temperature monitor so every single person gets a temperature check and then we also have to fill out a questionnaire every day. Additionally, when we are doing cesarean sections, we are in full PPE so every single one of us is wearing an N95 respirator. We wear a surgical mask over it, we have a face shield, gloves, gowns, um, and with that protocol in place there actually has not been a single obstetrician that's tested positive for COVID during the pandemic meaning the screening that we're doing is working, um, which is why we do not test people on a regular basis. Someone also asked, can they have a support person in the cesarean section? And the answer is, of course. So your partner can certainly still be in the C-section. And the C-section protocols in general are exactly the same as prior to COVID. Um, there are quite a few questions in the chat that I answered, so I do recommend going through them. I also just want to give a plug for daycare. I will tell you both my kids have been in daycare during COVID and it's been wonderful and very safe for both of them. So I want all of you to feel safe sending your kids to school, whether it is early childhood or elementary. Um, and I think it substantially takes some of the stress off of you during pregnancy, um, especially with having to homeschool if you don't have a other choice. Well, thank you for that. That's. Uh... There you go, straight from the horse's mouth. Somebody who's using daycare says it's safe. We've seen it uh, professionally, and uh, Dr. Keene has seen it personally. So uh, that's all good. Thank you. Um, Hannah, one last question for you. Um, I, I, don't, I, I think this is not related to COVID, but uh, one mom asked for breast milk, is there any specific type of food that helps? And by assuming helps, I think you mean helps promote lactation. Um, and also what kinds of foods should we avoid? Um, what do you have to say to that, Mom? Okay, um, so my advice on that topic is um, if you feel like it before you have the baby, you could bake some lactation cookies. It's not required, it's not necessary. If you hate baking, you don't have to do it. If somebody's offering to do something for you, you could ask them if they'd like to make you lactation cookies. There are many, many recipes that you can Google and find. Uh, the main ingredients are brewer's yeast, um, oatmeal, um, 
and flaxseed, uh, and of course, chocolate chips. We have to have chocolate chips. Um, so those are glorified oatmeal cookies that are called lactation cookies. They're also available for purchase. Uh, if you're not a baker, that's okay. Um, most important thing to know is that breastfeeding moms need a well-balanced diet. You need fruits and vegetables. Um, you need protein. You need healthy fats. Uh, all of those things are important to uh, support you as well as the baby uh, nutritionally. Um, there's not a quantity amount of water that you have to drink. In fact, we find that if moms are drinking gallons of water a day, and I have seen some moms who have done that, um, they, they actually decrease their milk supply. So you want to drink to quench your thirst because um, breastfeeding does make you feel thirsty. Uh, and so you want to quench your thirst, but you do not, there's no amount of water that you have to drink uh, while you're breastfeeding. And in terms of foods that you should avoid, uh, there are no foods that you need to avoid other than, I mean, I would not encourage lots of sushi with raw fish, uh, those kind of uh, caution, that's just being very cautious about that. Um, but, and same thing with caffeine, uh, Sometimes caffeine can make babies a little bit anxious or jittery or not being able to fall asleep. You'll, that's kind of trial and error. Um, so you want to be careful about how much caffeine you're consuming after when you're breastfeeding. Um, but if you think about it, there are a variety of diets around the world uh, that breastfeeding moms are consuming. Um, rice and beans, um, lots of vegetables. I mean, there are just many, many different diets. Uh, and they're all healthy. Um, so we don't have countries in this world where we have only colicky babies. So there is no food that you really have to avoid uh, when you're breastfeeding. There is a lot of misinformation out there, but there's nothing that you have to avoid. Uh, thank you for that. And this, this cannot be substantiated with a study, but I do know that M&Ms in the lactation cookies really, <laughs> really help. So I would include those in your recipe. Okay, we have time for one last question and I'm gonna take this one. Um, mom had asked, what are the signs of a newborn having COVID? Say after we come home and have visitors, what are the signs of a baby with COVID? Well, they actually are not that different from uh, an adult with COVID. Um, now, I will say this, when you get home, your baby will sneeze and that is a reflex. So don't pay any attention to a baby sneezing. That is really nothing to worry about. However, any of the other symptoms that are um, uh, well known to occur with COVID or most other viral illnesses uh, are important to bring up. And again, when I, what I'm about to say is very different for a child who's two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, than for a child who's six years, eight years, 10 years, right? If your child is 10 years old and he's got a little mild cough, and he's running around in the backyard and he feels fine, then you know, he's probably fine. You're not really gonna rush to the doctor for that. However, any cough, any cough in a child that young, a newborn, that child needs to be evaluated. So you gotta call your doctor. And I would have said this a year ago, pre-pandemic, um, cough is not a good sign. Fever is not a good sign in a two or three or four week old. What do I mean by fever? Well, honestly, 100.5 or higher. So uh, we have a low threshold to evaluating these kids. Many of them are fine. They don't have much more than just a little cold. But you don't know that right away. And um, we want to see kids who appear sick to you. Again, not sneezing, coughing, fever. Those are two signs that we worry about a lot. Some of the other signs of COVID are uh, the same things that you might experience, but it's hard to know in a baby. How do you tell if a four-week-old has a headache? I don't know. How do you tell if a four-week-old has body aches? I don't know. So sometimes you can't always get those signs or symptoms. Uh, vomiting, diarrhea, um, extreme fussiness. Uh, you've done everything you can, and the child is just crying, crying, crying. Not a good sign. Um, and the opposite. Um, the baby is very lethargic, going long periods of time between eating or feeding just for a few minutes at a time and falling asleep and not waking up for hours. Um, kind of laying there like a limp dish rag. Those are always bad signs. So nothing subtle, 
uh, you would obviously call us if any of that happened. But uh, the point is the signs for COVID uh, can be difficult to tell sometimes, particularly in an infant, um, and they're not very specific, uh, right? Vomiting, diarrhea, cough. There's a million diseases that cause those things. Uh, but in any infant, we'd want to evaluate a child who appears ill or is coughing, has a fever, uh, has a lot of diarrhea, a lot of vomiting. You know, we want to see those kids. So be sure to call your doctor if you see that for any reason, even if they haven't been exposed to COVID. Um, it's important to, to find out. Um, all right. It is now 7.05. We have gone for an hour. I want to respect everybody's time. I want to thank our uh, panelists tonight, uh, Hannah Goldstein from Pediatrust, and especially Dr. Melissa Keene uh, from the Midwest Center for Women's Health. Thank you both for uh, your insights. Uh, again, we'll be sending out an email with the link to the recording for this session and some of the other resources that we mentioned. Um, and uh, good luck to all of you and uh, hope your pregnancy goes well. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now. Have a great evening, everyone.